Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar, Taxes, COLAs, and Working After Retirement. Uh, today's webinar will go about 30 minutes. Uh, we'll cover all the things that uh, some of you may be uh, near retirement, um, some of you may be retired already, um, and we'll talk about all of the details uh, about these after retirement topics um, this afternoon. So a couple housekeeping items before we get uh, started. First, uh, my name is Jeff Paps. I'm Logger's Education and Outreach Coordinator. Um, second, questions. So if you want to ask questions this afternoon, uh, the Zoom webinar um, interface does allow you to do that. So um, I won't be able to take them verbally, but I will be able to take them if you type them in. So uh, what you're going to need to do is, is the dialog box that appeared where you're seeing my screen currently. Um, you will be able to um, ask questions from that box. So at the bottom of the box, there's a menu. It may have disappeared, but you'll just have to scroll over it. There's a section in there that's called Q&A. Um, Q&A is where um, you can type in those questions. I'll see them as they come in, and then I'll answer them as they come in. Now, some of them I may wait um, and reach back out to you at a, at a later time if it's more personal to you or things like that. But uh, um, that's kind of what we're gonna what we're gonna go through today um, as far as how you're gonna ask questions. So feel free to type those in at any point, even if it's not really related to what we're talking about. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have today. Uh, so let's get right into it. So first, we're going to talk about returning to work. So um, there's a there's a large portion of you on the webinar today that are already drawing a benefit from loggers, um, and some of you that may be considering drawing a benefit sometime in the near future. So if you're thinking about um, beginning drawing your benefit, leaving public service or have already left public service, and you're thinking about returning to work, there are some options for you for um, continuing to um, be employed and, uh, and, and drawing your loggers benefit. Um, so, um, and not having any sort of imp impacts. There is, you know, one potential impact there, but we'll talk about that. Um, so first let's talk, um, generally speaking, first you can employ with a non-loggers employer. So this is any subdivision or not any that's any subdivision or non-subdivision so any um any any employer that's outside of the logger system that uh, doesn't have um a logger's benefit provided to them you can work there as much as you want and make as much as you want and you will continue to receive your full unreduced logger's benefit along with working at this non-loggers employer. I mean, a prime example is, of that is like private sector. So maybe you're going and working at Walmart or, or, um, or whatever it may be private sector wise, uh, but you can do that as much as you want, make as much as you want. And there won't be any negative impacts to your loggers benefit. You can reemploy part-time with any loggers employer. Now this includes the employer from which you either are planning to retire from or are already retired from for the retirees that are on the line today. Um, so you can do this. You can reemploy part-time. Now keep in mind, loggers does not define full-time employment. The statutes that govern loggers don't define that for us. But what, what is defined is a covered position and an uncovered position. And that, that's defined by the number of hours annually a position is required to work. So when a subdivision joins loggers, they make an election of the number of hours an individual must work to be eligible for loggers coverage. Okay, that's either 1,500, 1,250, or 1,000 hours annually. So if you're returning to the, why this is important is for if you're returning to the employer from which you're drawing a benefit, um, you'll need to maintain below the um, annual hours required at that subdivision, particularly because if you end up working in a covered position, uh, that could result in a suspended benefit, okay? So um, if you're planning to work part-time with a 
with either the same law, particularly if you're planning to work part time at the same employer from which you already are drawing a benefit or planning to, you'll need to maintain below um, the annual hours elected at the subdivision um, in order to not have any negative impacts to your loggers benefit. Uh, William just asked, since loggers is considered a public pension, is it exempt from Missouri state income tax? Yes, uh, there are limitations and there are eligibility requirements. I will get to those in, um, in a minute. Har Harley, I'll get to that. Same question that Ilya William asked. So we'll get there. Um, I am going to talk about the Missouri public pension exemption, but there are some limitations. So just keep that in mind. Okay. <clears throat> nope. Sorry about that. So the other thing that's that's a key here is there's no break in service required for the part time employment. So if you um, leave employment and you want to um, go go and work part time at the same subdivision, you don't have to have any sort of break in service. You could go like say it's you know, March 1st is when your effective date for payment from loggers. You could be February 28th or 29th could be your last day of full time employment. And March 1st can be your first time of uncovered part time employment. You can also reemploy with a different loggers employer. So outside of your current employer, uh, you can reemploy full time with this different loggers employer. To do this, you must have a one calendar month break in employment. The one calendar month break must be a calendar month from retirement effective date or termination date, whichever is later. Okay. <clears throat> you would begin accruing an additional separate loggers benefit. And the second retirement um, benefit would be added to your current benefit you've already received. Um, so you're essentially accruing an additional separate loggers benefit, and then you're vested in that benefit after 12 consecutive months. And since you're a retired reemployee, the vesting um, the vesting shrinks down to 12 months instead of five years, but it is consecutive. Okay. All right. So. The question of the day, taxes and exemptions. First and foremost, uh, your tax documents have been mailed. Um, they were dropped in the mail um, early this week and um, should be in your inboxes by sometime either this week or next week. If you haven't received your tax documents by the 15th of February, uh, please be sure to give us a call uh, as we may not have had an updated mailing address for you. And it may have, um, and 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 it may have just gotten lost in the shuffle or returned to us um, due to, due to those things. Now, typically, if it's returned, we try to reach out to you um, to to try and get you get an updated mailing address. Um, but uh, you'll need to call us to get all of that get all of that done. But if you haven't received it by the fifteenth, um, you need you'll need to call us. Okay. But let's talk a little bit about um, state and federal income taxes. First and foremost, your benefit is um, subject to state and federal income taxes. It's a fully taxable benefit. Now, there are some exemptions that apply, but, uh, but as far as just generally speaking, it's taxable. Uh, if your employer was contributory, what this means is they required you to contribute um, out of your paycheck. It could have been 2%, 4%, or 6%. Um, those contributions that you paid in are after tax. Okay, so there's a portion of your monthly benefit that will be non-taxable. Now, the way that it's that it's actually calculated out um, is a little bit different than you might think. Okay, so the way loggers views contributions is um, the first twenty-seven thousand. So, if you had twenty-seven thousand dollars in member contributions, um, we're paying out as far as how loggers is accounting for it. We're paying out your contributions um, first. So if you have $27,000 in member contributions, the first $27,000 you receive in loggers or from loggers is considered your monthly contributions and everything after that is employer assets. Okay, the way the IRS views it is not the same. Okay, so what the IRS does is they uh, take your contribution balance and they divide it by the number of months that they project you will live in retirement. 
Um, and then they divide that $27,000 by the number of months that they expect you to live. And that will create the portion of your monthly payment that is non-taxable and the rest is fully taxable, okay? So just keep that in mind um, with the, um, with, with the way the contributions work. Um, if you made mandated contributions out of your paycheck, those were after tax. Um, and therefore there is a portion of your monthly benefit that won't be taxable due to those contributions. <clears throat> the other side is the Missouri public pension exemption. Okay, this is uh, from the revised Missouri state statute, chapter 143.124 of the revenue code. Um, and what this does is it allows for up to 100% of your public pension benefits to be tax exempt. You have to meet eligibility requirements. So don't take this as my benefits fully tax exempt in the state of Missouri. There are eligibility requirements and there are limitations to the exemption. Okay. Um, but there are 100% um, potentially 100% of your benefit may be tax exempt. The total public pension exemption is limited to the maximum Social Security benefit for each spouse. So if it's like 38,000, let's just say, I think it's higher than that now, but let's just say that's our number. Um, then if you're receiving $38,000 or less in, uh, in public pension income for the state of Missouri, then 100% uh, then of that would be tax exempt if you meet the eligibility requirements, which we're gonna get to, okay? Anything in excess of the exemption is fully taxable, okay? So if, you, if the exemption is 38,000 and you receive 70,000, well then anything in excess, which in that case would be $32,000, would be fully taxable for the state of Missouri, okay? The eligibility requirements of this, um, to be eligible for um, the, the, um, the Missouri public pension exemption, these are the two eligibility requirements. So married couples with an adjusted gross income of less than 100,000 or single individuals with an adjusted gross income of less than 85,000. If you meet those eligibility requirements, then 100% of your public pension benefits limited to the maximum social security amount for each spouse um, is, is exempted from your Missouri state income taxes not federal, just Missouri, okay? If you're in excess of these adjusted gross income um, eligibility requirements, you may be eligible for a partial exemption, okay? What that partial exemption is, don't know. We're not tax experts here. We're not also not, not able to give you tax advice. So if you need to know if you are in, in the excess or if you're trying to figure out how you should be applying your state income taxes, that's where uh, speaking to an accountant could definitely come in handy, okay? Because you may call us and tell us, well, how should I withhold this or what should I withhold? And we're not gonna be able to tell you, okay? <laughs> if you qualify for the, <coughs> the Supplemental Security Income SSI or Social Security Disability Insurance Deduction, these are lower earner deductions, you must reduce your pension exemption by the deduction amount, okay? That's just one of those things to, to note uh, from the statute. but. So let me give you kind of an example of how folks can think that this means that it's fully tax exempt and that they don't need to withhold anything and how that can come back to bite them, especially in that first year of retirement. Um, we have some folks that may have taken um, a partial lump sum. Uh, and if you took that partial lump sum and you had loggers cut you a check and pay you directly, as you know, those funds are fully taxable. Um, and that would include state income taxes. So if the maximum, if the maximum amount of the, of the um, exemption is 38,000 and your lump sum was 70K and you did that on January 1 of last year, not this year, did that on January 1 of last year, then you had excess funds that were out, excess funds from the partial lump sum that don't qualify for the exemption plus every single monthly payment that you received in the year of 2022 that will also um, not, not necessarily qualify for the exemption and be, and be fully taxable for the state of Missouri. So sometimes you can easily kind of make the mistake of thinking, oh, there's an exemption in Missouri, so I don't need to withhold. Um, but before you make that decision, the best person to talk to about that is a tax advisor. Um, they're the folks that, that, that know the tax law in and out 
They're the folks that can give you the advice that you seek um, as to whether or not you're withholding taxes correctly. Because at the end of the day, when you're retired, obviously you don't want to have a, a unexpected tax season. You want it to be pretty well expected. You don't want to owe a lot. You don't want to get paid back a lot. You kind of just want it to be um, just a process you have to go through. Um, and that's where a tax advisor can help you tremendously. Um, so, so that's it on taxes. Couple, uh, one other note. Two, well, two things. Just another reminder. Uh, we mailed we mailed your tax documents at the beginning of this week, um, so they should be in your mailbox in the next couple of weeks. Now, keep in mind, um, every financial institution in the country that has to give out tax documents is doing the same thing right now. So there are noted postal delays. Um, so just keep that in mind as well is that it's not going to be that it may not be there tomorrow. It might be there next week. Um, but uh, if you, again, if you haven't received it by the 15th, make sure you, you, uh, you give us a call um, and we can, we can get you access to it. The other thing just to kind of note is February 1st payments are when the, um, federal tax tables are adjusted in our system. So they're sent to us in like mid-January and maybe even not even mid-January, maybe first week of January, but it's still not enough time for us to be able to get that adjusted on the back end for your payment, um, for your actual payment in January 1st, because we're paying that January 1st payment for the month of January, even though they're issuing those, those tax tables usually in early January, but by then we've already paid you. So um, we adjust those on your February 1st payments, which are today, okay? So um, your dollar amounts in your payments may look a little bit different and that has li that's likely due to um, the, that's likely due to the, the, the um, adjustments in the tax tables as well. We are no longer sending check stubs um, that would show you those adjustments. Um, so, so make sure you're looking at your deposit for the, for things like that. Um, we don't send the check, check stubs anymore just to, to save the system and, and save your, save the spending of your money, um, on postage and the printing of, uh, of those, of those stubs. Um, it was getting to be significantly costly for the, for the system to send those. So, um, <clears throat> that's it on taxes at this point. The other things to talk about are cost of living adjustments. Now, of course, if you have questions or something, please feel free to, to, um, to, to send them uh, send them in. I'll, I'll answer them as they come in. Just note that if it's something along the lines of advice, I'm not going to be able to, to give you any of that. Okay. So cost of living adjustments. Um, this is a, a COLA. That's what, what it's called. So cost of living adjustments uh, for loggers operate like this. They're payable on October 1st of every year. That's when your benefit will increase is on your payment on October 1st. They're based on the consumer price index. That's a measure of inflation. That They cannot exceed 4% per year, but are cumulative year to year, which means we're going to catch you up over time. Okay, so even if CPI is higher than 4%, um, we're going to catch you up um, in future years with future increases. Okay, um, and you must be retired for 12 full months, including in October 1st, to be eligible for your first adjustment. So this is generally, if you retire on October 1st, you get an adjustment the next October 1st. If you retire before or after that, you're not exactly, it's not exactly on a 12 month cycle. It's usually a couple more, a couple more months than 12 months, and then you get your first adjustment and then it's every 12 months thereafter. Okay. Um, so that's cost of living adjustments. Um, it doesn't seem like a whole lot, you know, we could, sorry, we could, you know, when we're talking 4% on average, you know, over, over the existence of our, of our plan, it's been a little under 2%. Um, you, when you, when you look at it, you and I, if it's like, I am getting more dollars in my check, which is great. Um, but that's not really what it, what it's actually designed to do. What it's designed to do is, is keep pace with inflation um, as best it can with that 4% cap. But catching you up over time is, is really important as well. So if you're a retiree in 1993, receiving $1,200 a month or $14,400 annually, because, because the cost of goods increased by around 65%, in 2013, you would have been receiving $1,964 $1, a month or 2000 or 23000 
$572 annually. That's what this increase is designed to do so that as the cost of things is increasing, your benefits increasing as well. Um, it's not a perfect science, but, but it is a, a component to the plan that's very, very important to retirees, very important to the system as a whole. I mean, all of the staff very much understand how valuable that is uh, for our retirees. Um, and the board very much understands that as well. Um, so just keeping that in mind that, that this is a mechanism that's in place that is specifically designed to keep up with um, the cost of goods increasing. <clears throat> okay, so the pop-up provision, these are more, again, after retirement topics, just something to be thinking about. Um, if you are retired um, already, or you're thinking about retiring, and you chose option A or option B, okay? So if you chose option A or option B, there is a provision that if your spouse um, or the beneficiary you have listed on option A or option B were to predecease you, uh, you will need to notify us, okay? You'll need to notify our office and then we'll pop you back up to the full life allowance. So the 100% of your monthly benefit, because right now, by choosing option A or option B, you took a reduction to your payment. By, um, by choosing to, or, or not choosing, but by your spouse predeceasing you, there's a provision in law that does allow you to pop, pop this up. Now, um, the one thing is, is if you retired, I believe, prior to September of 1996, you're not eligible for the pop-up. Um, but anybody be after that um, is eligible for the pop-up, Okay. So uh, that's one thing to kind of kind of be considering is if you do have option A or option B um, and your spouse has predeceased you and you haven't notified us, you may be eligible for the pop-up provision. Um, or if you've already selected A or B, but your spouse is still alive, um, just keep in mind that if, if your spouse were to predecease you, we will uh, increase, increase your benefit back up to the 100% of your life allowance amount um, if, if they were to predecease you. So, um, you know, this is one thing we always we always like to like to talk about, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like an understood amongst retirees is just how valuable this benefit is, because I hear it from retirees all the time when I'm in the field um, or over the phone or things like that of just how valuable um, the, the plan that they have been um, receiving over the last several years or, you know, decades, however long it's been for some retirees, that it's just so valuable for them. But it just it's it's good to just be thinking about just how how large of an impact a defined benefit plan can have. So this is just a quick little example, and then we're gonna uh, go to stay connected, and then I'll open it for any questions that you may have. I told you it'd only be about thirty minutes today. So um, the value of this benefit. So when we say value, what we're talking about is total amount payable, um, not value every month, because I understand if you're a retiree, you value it every month, right? Because you're getting that check every month and you're spending that every month, okay? But this assumes a retiree with a $55,677 final average salary, your 25 years of service, and our 1.5% L7 benefit program. It also assumes that this individual for their 25 years of service contributed 4% of their salary each and every month, Okay. So during that time, they would have accumulated $46,124 in contributions by the time they retire. They live 20 years into retirement. They'll have received essentially 10 times um, what they paid in. Uh, so they'd receive $417,578, one month at a time, but in total, that's the amount loggers would have paid that individual. And then of course, as you continue to live in retirement, the larger the dollar amount that you receive from us. Or, or in total, right? So you're receiving it one month at a time at the larger um, amount in total that you would receive. So 30 years into retirement, that's uh, $626,370 in total this person would have received one month at a time. Also, these illustrations do not include cost of living adjustments. It ju it's just a straight 20 years of, of a payment based on the, that data or 30 years of a payment based on the data, okay? So that's just to note, I think you all know, especially those that are retirees on the line, I understand just how valuable the benefit is for you. Um, but it, also, it is also good just to be thinking about that's how much in total um, and how valuable it is for you in total, okay?
Okay, so I've got some questions that have that have been flying in, so we're going to go ahead and uh, and answer those at this point. Uh, Craig asked, "Is the pop up retroactive if the beneficiary doesn't notify right away after spousal predeceasement?" The answer is no. Uh, we will pop it up on the first on the first available payment in the future. Um, we won't retro it back. So that's why notifying us of a death occurring um, as soon as you can is very important. Won't retro, it will be from a certain date forward. Okay, so it's upon notification. Let's see. Uh, Nancy asked about how do I change or eliminate federal tax deducted from my benefit? Um, so you can update your withholdings either by completing um, a W-4P form, that's the federal form, um, or you can um, complete it online. Uh, one of the two ways is how you can up, update it. Um, I will tell you that the new form, because it's a newer form that was just released this year, the new form makes it very difficult for you to have nothing withheld. Um, but um, it, it, there, there are ways to get there. So, um, so if you um, if you need to update, that's your two ways: you either complete the forms, um, paper forms, and mail them in, or fax them in, um, or you go online um, and update them that way. Uh, John, if you retire June first, when would your first when you, when would you receive your first check? June first. Um, so, uh, assuming you're terminating employment either June first or May thirty first, um, we pay benefits on the first of the month forward. And John, it might be good for you to attend a virtual pre-retirement seminar. We've got one coming up next week. Um, it's a little bit more in depth than this. We just covered some high level topics for this webinar, just short and sweet. Um, the, the virtual seminars are excellent. And they're about an hour and a half long. Um, or attend the, another shorter webinar with the payment options and application process. That'll also help clear up some of those details. Um, but definitely uh, go to our events page, take a look at all the, all the webinars that we have to offer or also in-person pre-retirement seminars across the state as well. Um, Scott, it's not required that you retire on a first of a month. That's just when we're gonna pay. We're paying benefits on the first banking day of the month. You can retire whenever you want. Now, depending on what time in the month you retire, depends on whether or not you get it the first of the month that you continue to work into or the first of the next month. But we're gonna pay benefits on the first. If you retired February of 2021, when might I see a COLA? So let's see, October of 22, October of 23 uh, is likely when, when you are going to see um, your first one because you have to be retired for 12 full months, including in October 1st. But on February 20, 2021, you're going to be that October of 21 is a no. Well, actually, you should have received. If you retired in February of 21, sorry, I'm doing the math in my head, February 28. You should have received, received an adjustment October of 22. If it's February of 22, then an adjustment. Okay, so um, that's pretty much all that I've received on questions. Uh, if there are, oh, just got another one from Steve, okay. Let's, Uh, Steve, your exemption is the same as everyone else's. Um, it, it, the, the public pension exemption is for any person who is receiving public pension income in the state of Missouri, which is, which includes loggers members. Um, it's limited to the maximum social security amount. And if you meet the eligibility requirements, there'll be um, and you're receiving less than the maximum exemption amount, then you could have a fully tax exempt benefit for the state of Missouri. Um, but there isn't anything as far as for the state of Missouri. Now, 
there was at one point, um, now this passed through federal law this last, um, this actually in December of Secure 2.0. Um, at one point, we had the, you had a, um, a federal, you qualified for a federal um, income tax deduction if you had your long-term care premiums withheld from your loggers payment. And Secure 2.0 actually not, didn't eliminate the, the deduction, it just eliminated the requirement of having it withheld from your payment. Um, so you will, you will qualify as a, as, as a police officer um, to, to also have that, that deduction um, available. It's called the HELPS deduction. Um, and you need to talk to your, uh, to, to your tax advisor on how to, how to handle that and how to qualify for it. Uh, is this uh, webinar recorded later for playback? Yes. And David, we also have a, a, a more recent, well, we have one that we did recently a few months ago that, that'll, that's going to be on our YouTube channel. Um, and you can, you can view that at any time. And I will be getting this one up in the next couple of weeks. Hi, Vitula. Um, so the the four percent is the max how much carried over is dependent on the year that you retired in most folks let this year it was about one percent carryover from the year prior and this year um cpi at the time was I believe in the eight percent range so another four percent or so is is carried over right now um and and then we'll see how october 1st of this year goes um so you might be seeing four percent for quite a few years um and catching you up over that time Um, does Social Security get reduced by your loggers benefit? No. Um, Social Security is not reduced um, due to you receiving a loggers benefit and Social Security shouldn't be reduced due to you receiving a loggers benefit either. So there's no offsets on either side of that. Now, you may have a life and temporary plan um, and life and temporary plans. What they do is they um, is they pay a 2% times your salary times years of service um, from when you retired until the age of 62 or 65, whichever the program said, and then it will go down to a base benefit, but that's not a offset because of, that's because of the election that your subdivision made and that they had in place when you retired. All right, so I think uh, at this point, we're gonna go ahead and close the webinar. If you do have more questions for us, please feel free to reach out, info at mologgers.org. Reach out to us on social media. Give us a call. Uh, we're happy to answer any question that you guys have and assist you in any way that we can. Um, but for now, I do, do very much appreciate you all taking, it, taking time out of your day to listen to me. Um, I hope that you all have a great rest of your week. And again, if you need anything, feel free to, uh, to reach out. Thanks.